these, either through collaboratives or through in, uh, where I've had many different representatives from school committees where I've come in and done specific uh, workshops for particular school committees. Um, and so the, I think the first question that, uh, especially in light of the reading of the will of Mr. Smith is, does anything that I'm going to say apply to the Board of Trustees of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School? And the answer is yes. Um, and so I do want to give a little bit of some preliminary information um, in terms of setting up uh, before I go into the school committee itself. As you all know, because I was here for the partial of reading of the will. Um, when Oliver Ames, uh, when Oliver Smith basically entered into that will, it was a private document. He was asking the city of Northampton to do something about the creation of two different entities. One was the two farms, and the other one was the school for industry, is the way he called it. Um, and those of us who are female might get a little bit perturbed that he only referred to two boys being admitted, but we'll, go, we'll not go there. Um, in any case, it was not until 1918 that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts actually recognized um, Smith Vocational Agricultural School. And if the Massachusetts legislature had not passed a piece of special legislation, which is Chapter 151 of the Acts of 1918, um, Smith Voc would not be known as we know it today. Um, and so with that act, the legislature basically said, it is a public school and it will be established. They bought into the method that uh, Mr. Smith had requested in terms of superintendents is the way the will refer to it, not trustees, superintendents. Um, and it was at that time that the legislature changed it to trustees because it ran right into um, a possible conflict with who is the superintendent of schools, which was already contained in the statute. So you have that act in 1918, and then subsequently the Massachusetts legislature again, and I presume at the behest of individuals in Northampton and particularly in Smith, at Smith, in the 1950s passed legislation which is now codified in Chapter 74, Section uh, 24, which basically says that Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School shall be a public state approved vocational school. And with that imprimatur, brought Smith under chapter 71 and chapter 74, the vocational statute, as well as chapter 71, the ever expansive education statute of Massachusetts. Now that leads me into I felt like I had to cover that because I'm going to be talking about school committees and I think a legitimate question anybody can raise is does that really apply to trustees of Smith Vocational and the answer is yes and if you take a look at the legislative history um, leading up particularly to chapter 74 section 24 you can see that it did not want Smith to be any different than other vocational schools somewhat different but not necessarily um, different in other ways. So uh, for me, um, I have been practicing law so long and I am so ancient that when I started practicing law um, back in 1978, Massachusetts was actually controlled by Chapter 71, which called for the school committee or the board of trustees to have all the power within the school district. Um, a superintendent of schools only had the power of recommendation, nothing more. A principal was a glorified teacher. In fact, the, the cases actually referred to principals being supervisory teachers and not administrators or managers. Um, and then June 18th, 1993 rolled around. It was a Friday in June, and I remember it well, because at midnight that night, the Education Reform Act went into effect. It was an emergency preamble, which meant it went into effect right away at 12.01. And suddenly with that, everything got upended. Um, and so where I began 
my practice was at a time when the school committee controlled everything and then on June 19th or um, at 12.01 a.m. suddenly we had a very different situation. Now we had a school committee and I would have to say in many ways also the board of trustees who are essentially relegated to three albeit very important matters but nonetheless very limited specified policy budget hiring of the superintendent of schools um, and so whereas on June 18th 1993 during the day the school committee had authority over personnel could hire fire teachers could hire fire principals not with, and hire fire superintendents the next day they could do none of that except the superintendent of schools um, and so with that shift with the authority now moving on a very balanced kind of system now we had a superintendent of schools who was essentially the executive the manager the individual who was uh, supposed to be the educational leader of the school district you also had building based management so now principals had powers of management they were able to make decisions uh, with the approval of the superintendent of schools and in light um, and consistent with laws and statutes and policy. And so the role of the school committee and the board of trustees shifted greatly with that move. Um, and suddenly issues concerning students, for example, were very limited. They deal with policy only, not individual school, uh, school students' uh, decisions. Uh, personnel issues were very limited with the exception of the assistant superintendent and superintendent business um, administrator um, where joint roles were had um, but by and large this um, authority changed quite dramatically and I think what happened for a lot of school committees as well as for trustees of um, vocational schools and otherwise is it became a very difficult kind of shift for people um, because suddenly their authority was much more hands-off, um, was much more overseeing, generally speaking, what was happening, but nothing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the reason why I raise that is because I think it's important to remember that that's the structure of Massachusetts at the current time. And that's why when I start talking about school committees or board of trustees the only actions that a board of trustees can take that are meaningful is when you act as a deliberative body um, one school committee member one trustee has no authority as an individual um, they are no different than a public citizen um, if they are not here at a meeting that's been convened based upon an agenda over which you have control. Um, and so one of the documents I included in your materials was actually um, what I think is, is a really good uh, hand preamble from the handbook of the MASC on what it is to be a school committee member. And it deals with kind of nudgy issues that I deal with all the time um, from lots of different school committee members, from superintendents, from principals. So for example, you know what authority does a member of the school committee have to take a look at a personnel file well unless it's a superintendent it's none um, absolutely none and we can say that pretty comfortably because we've actually got case law on it too um, what authority does the board uh, a member of the trustees or a member of the school committee have to walk into a school building and <coughs> demand um, as one of my lovely school committee members did the other day, um, and demand that the superintendent have ready in four hours uh, a total printout of this particular expenditure and explaining how and why everything was, was paid for in the particular way that it was. There was no authority to do that. The school committee hadn't approved it. The school committee hadn't voted to ask the individual to do it. Um, and so, his claim was no different than a public cit uh, citizen coming in and essentially making an a public records request. 
um, because that is the authority of an individual acting as an individual. Yes, they have a unique position because they are a member of a deliberative body, but um, it is only when they are together as a group that they can actually exercise that authority unless the board or the school committee votes ahead of time to authorize um, a single person to represent them in some capacity, which we have a great deal, um, because sometimes things come up uh, between meetings, uh, very hard to uh, conduct or to convene or to call an emergency meeting. It really does have to be an emergency. Um, and so sometimes um, school committees and boards have recommended or voted, as they have to do, it has to be by vote, to give a chair some authority during the break uh, between meetings to at least get things on the agenda, to move things forward enough for the uh, board to vote. Obviously, the one key area that the school committee and the board still have a lot of authority over, and that's collective bargaining. Um, you are the municipal representative of the city uh, for purposes of collective bargaining with Unit D. Um, and the statute is very clear. Um, and so to the extent that you get involved in personnel decisions through the means of the contract um, and bargaining, that certainly is a role for the Board of Trustees and a very important role for the Board of Trustees. So that is one piece of material that I, I left to the board um, and I really do recommend that you, you read it sometimes. I mean, the handbook of, or the preamble from the handbook of the school committees. Because I think it does deal with a lot of very difficult issues that school committees face. I mean, one of the biggest issues that I have had to advise school committee members on various times, various places, is um, they are viewed as the public's representative on this body. And it's an important role. And I think a lot of individuals uh, believe that you actually have more authority than you do. And so oftentimes complaints, and I think John probably in your capacity as superintendent over in Northampton, uh, would know that complaints get to the school committee and they have to say, no, you have to, it's not for us. This is about personnel, or it's about a student matter, or it's about something that's not within our control. You need to go back to where it belongs. If it's a student issue and an, or an employee issue, where that employee is actually on the staff of the principal, then it's gotta go all the way back to the principal and then move its way up to the superintendent. Um, the board, well, nor the school committee really has the authority to address those issues. So I, I say that because before you can begin to talk about the open meeting law, you have to have the concept over what you have control over. Because in many different ways, um, and how you have to act, because the open meeting law is going to cover how you deliberate and how you make those decisions for which you do have the authority. Um, and for my purposes, when I start talking about the open meeting law, I really want people to recognize it is not a statute to play around with. It is an important statute. It's a valuable statute. You have to follow it to, you know, absolutely uh, right to the letter, in my view. Uh, that was made very clear once the Attorney General took over responsibility. The law was revised and the Attorney General took over for enforcement. It is clear from their enforcement actions, which we see all the time um, because they get published, um, that they take it very seriously and very conservatively. They err on the side of meeting, open, well done record minutes that include well within enough information for the public to know. And if there's any kind of question mark about whether something was inappropriate or not, they're going to go with a violation. I mean, that's pretty clear. I think anybody who's seen their enforcement decisions lately, um, there are certain school committees and boards select them in that have had the experience of 
being under the Attorney General's gun more than 20 times. Um, and so this is a law that gets enforced quite frequently. So let's, I think, you know, when we talk about the open meeting law, um, please remember that what I'm doing, I am the messenger. This is not something that there's a lot of deviation on. Um, and I didn't even do my own personal outline. I just gave you the open meeting law advisory and handout from uh, Attorney General Keeley that she updated in March of 2015. She's going to be updating it again this year so that it'll probably have some more information. Um, that she has included some nuances about the statute that maybe didn't become apparent. So under tab one is the material from the handbook on the MASC, from the MASC. Tab two is the actual advisory from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education right after Ed was born passed um, on the change in the control over a school district. Uh, many people were not in their positions like I was at the time that this, that, that was passed. Um, and issued, and so I thought it would be helpful for you to have a copy of it. It's not readily accessible, the advisory on governance. Um, it is still the word from the department on the meaning of the Education Reform Act. I've also included um, under tab three, um, the State Ethics Commission's advisory to school committee members on appropriate actions and not running afoul of the conflict of interest law. <coughs> Um, which in and of itself can be a very tricky statute and I think the State Ethics Commission has acknowledged that it is frequently a very difficult statute to interpret and therefore they do feel that their role is to provide as much information as possible. And then obviously under tab four is the handout on the open meeting law. So some, some major concerns about the open meeting law. So the open <coughs> meeting law applies to any convening of a public body. Public body is a broad definition, but you're it. Um, we get into some technical questions sometimes about whether or not a subcommittee is a public body or not. But for our purposes, this is pretty clean and neat. It applies to any convening for the purpose of deliberation. So the deliberation is you're gonna actually hear, gain information about, and make a decision on a matter within your jurisdiction. Um, it is done by a quorum of the members of the public body, um, and it requires that there be notice of any such meeting. And the notice has to be clear and very direct. And if you change, for example, if you change the location of your meeting, your notice is now defective and you can't go forward with the meeting according to the Attorney General. That's how specific they want people to be. Um, <coughs> that has to be filed with, the notice has to be up within 48 hours prior to the meeting itself. Now, um, I think the biggest issue um, that has been um, a source of a lot of enforcement actions has been the use of email, number one, Number two, chance meetings, and I put that in quotes, because um, there are chance meetings and then there are chance meetings where it's been prearranged that we meet in aisle four of whole foods. That's a little bit different than a chance meeting or a social gathering. Um, and I put all those in quotes because I think they have all presented unique difficulties for school committee members um, and boards of trustees. My advice to people on uh, the use of email is don't, just don't. Um, those of uh, people who have gone to other workshops of mine know I hate email, it's a passion. Um, but I, as far as I'm concerned, whether it involves students or whether it involves public matters, uh, it is very hard to use email and not violate the open meeting law. And I'll give you a case in point. So a school committee member the school committee uh, chair announced uh, to the press that he was going to be doing something. Um, it uh, had never been discussed at a school committee member a meeting. Um, and a school committee member sent out an email to the chair with a CC to the other members simply saying, could we please put this on the agenda 
of a meeting to discuss. That's all. That was found to be a violation of the open meeting law because it was basically she was communicating to all the members of the committee and although all the purpose of her entire email was simply to say please have a meeting the bottom line is that that in and of itself because it was sent and cc to other members of the committee the attorney general deemed to be essentially a convening of the body well if that constituted an actual meeting in violation of the open meeting law you can't use email to do it I mean truly unless it's one email to one person and only one person and that's about it, it I just don't recommend it second thing is are your chance meetings please be very careful about chance meetings people see people um, and therefore when they see two or three members of a board having a conversation um, anywhere in public, legitimately I think the public raises a concern about whether or not something is going to be discussed because everybody knows in their own personal lives when they get together with a colleague from work, guess what? What's the first thing you start talking about? Work. And so they have, find it very difficult to believe that people are not having um, I think that the last category would be social um, events. You know, you're all invited to a particular party, a, a holiday party of some kind or an end of the year party, and you all have conversations. You can have conversations, but they better not be about official business, and particularly not official business that's up on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, and so it becomes very difficult to really do anything but mums the word away from this table, away from a meeting having been called to order, um, I strongly recommend that people steer clear of anything that does not involve having a conversation here in front of the public among your members as a deliberative body. Most things will be dealt with in open meeting. It is very difficult to bring a matter within executive session, I use them very carefully, and they are only for very specific purposes. Um, and the Attorney General has been very clear that when you decide to go into executive session for a purpose, um, not only must it be a very legitimate purpose, but you must give enough information to the public that they can reasonably ascertain that you're going in for a particular reason. So at one time we used to say things such as a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy with regard to litiga pending or threatened litigation and we ended the conversation there. That does not give the public enough information. Public has to know that there's actually pending or threatened litigation. You have to name it with reasonable specificity so that they understand what piece of litigation you're going to be discussing. There are some exceptions, for example, for confidentiality around student lawsuits, for example, where a student name is being used in the caption of the litigation, where we can, in fact, use the pseudonym and not give quite as much detail. Um, but that is an absolute requisite. It has to be a roll call vote to go into executive session. It has to be a roll call vote to go out of executive session. School committees and boards get very sloppy about that. Please be very careful. Um, and you must tell the public when you vote to go into executive session whether you will return to open session or not and give them an approximate timeline. Obviously, everybody knows things can happen, things can go a little bit longer. Um, but that is absolutely, absolutely key. Um, if you have gone into executive session for one purpose, you may not, under any circumstances, bring up a topic that is not within that particular purpose. And so you will see school committees who will go into executive session, boards of trustees, boards of selectmen, go in for three different purposes because they're going to be dealing with three different matters. All of them have to be dealt with separately. All of them have to be specified with re reasonable specificity. Um, I won't go through absolutely every 
or particular reason why you can go into executive session. Um, I think the major ones that we deal with, and now that there's collective bargaining, a strategy with regard to collective bargaining and collective bargaining, you're also allowed under that particular uh, permission for an executive session um, to go into an executive session to conduct a grievance session. So when we have a level three grievance before the board, that is permissible, that it be done in executive session under the collective bargaining exception. You have obviously the exception for discussion of pending litigation or threatened litigation. Um, that covers a wide variety of topics. Um, we do have decisions that say it does not necessarily have to be just a court case. It can be an administrative body, such as the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, Labor Relations Commission, um, any of those public bodies that have the authority uh, to render decisions. Um, and, and one of the last ones is generally when somebody has made a request um, or has filed a complaint against an individual who is an employee or connected with a public body and the public body is going to hear the complaint, um, obviously that can be done in executive session, but it's at the request of the individual who's brought the complaint. Um, at, at the request of the person who, against whom the complaint has been filed, they can opt to do it in open if they wish, and that's pretty much what they can choose to do. And I've had some people do that, um, where they have done that. But they also have the right to very specific notice to them that a complaint's going to be addressed. They have the right to have a representative or a lawyer with them to represent them. Um, to basically give them advice, not to speak to you, but to give you, uh, to give the person that they're representing advice on how to handle something um, during the course of the particular session. Uh, one of the areas that I think we have had a great deal of change in under the open meeting law are minutes of sessions of the body. Um, at one time, um, if you really follow Robert's rules of parliamentary procedure back in the day, very clearly, it's basically votes to count, and that's it. Um, the Attorney General has advised all public bodies who are doing minutes to make sure that your minutes are detailed enough that people can understand what the conversation was about, to be able to read a set of minutes and to have a basic understanding about what was discussed. Obviously, all votes have to be recorded perfectly, uh, you know, with the motion, the exact motion, the second, and the actual vote, but also the discussion has to be fairly um, in-depth. That applies to both open meeting as well as executive session. We used to think that under executive session, the minutes could be much less detailed. Yes, they can be much less detailed, but they have to be able to describe enough of what the bo public body discussed in that executive session so that the public, when you release those minutes, which you're going to have to do at some point, uh, can understand why you went into executive session and what the conversation was about. Um, executive session minutes must be released um, as soon as the purpose for which the executive session was held no longer exists. Um, in some cases, that takes a really long time. Litigation takes so sometimes it might not be for a few years while you finish litigation. In other cases, it can be as soon as you take the vote, the purpose is gone. Um, and that would often be t uh, where you're entering into contracts or approving collective bargaining agreements and that type of thing. The purpose for which you went into executive session to hash out whether or not you wanted to enter into this contract or not is now gone. And the public has a right to know um, that it comes and how the vote went. So it, it's a fairly, uh, my, my suggestion is that if a question comes up about the open meeting law that you ask, um, I, I do think it's not a bad idea. You can certainly call your attorney, but I think sometimes it's almost better to call the attorney general's office and get the officer of the day on because it, I can give you my advice 
but the, it is actually, you know, if you get the attorney general and then you write up an email afterwards to the person you listen to, you advise me the following, that is clear reliance and you're allowed to rely upon that if in fact someone brings a complaint against uh, the board for violations of the open meeting law and you relied on advice given from the attorney general's office. So I do recommend, they're very nice um, in terms of giving that advice and they're very helpful as well. Uh, sometimes it may be a matter that you do want my advice because it's a particularly tricky issue, or it's personnel, or it's very involves a privacy issue. Uh, but in any case, my advice is basically to follow the open meeting law to the T. Um, stay away from emails. Try to avoid meeting each other at various places um, and having conversations. And always please remember that the, the role of the Board of Trustees is as a deliberative body when you're here um, at a posted meeting of the board itself. And so, I mean, that's a broad overview. I, I wanted to give you the materials. I don't want to belabor points if people don't have any questions. So I'll ask a question going to the first part of your presentation on roles. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about your either your direct experience or things you've heard of about problems that can be caused when committee members enter buildings and engage in direct contact with staff without the superintendent being involved? Um, I, my personal experience has been from a, a fair number of cases that have arisen. I think there are a number of problems. Number one is in most cases, schools and school districts have visitation policies and observation policies. Um, and because a member of the school committee as a single person is no different than a public, than a regular citizen, um, for them to disregard those policies, I think um, does not set a good example for the members of the public. Um, because you will get that uh, occasional person um, parent or maybe someone else and a butter or whatever who is very angry and they want to just drop in instead of following what the policy requires. So I think that's number one. Number two, I don't think there's any question that as our concern about safety and protocol um, has increased, I think it is absolutely paramount that those in authority know when individuals who are not employees or uh, volunteers who are authorized to be there at that particular day are, are on the property without anyone knowing that they are. I think it's dangerous for them. I think it's dangerous for the people that are involved. The third thing is um, I think it raises significant questions in people's mind about whose authority is it. Um, in terms of un unless we recognize and acknowledge the authority of the superintendent and the principal to, to control the building, um, I think the bottom, the bottom line is it raises uh, concern and I think it blurs lines. I think some people begin to think that um, members of the school committee have way more authority than, than they do. And I don't want people to be led astray um, by the limited authority of a school committee member or the board of trustees. So I think for all those things. And then finally, I'm a big one on courtesy. I, if it's my house, you better let me invite you first or you know, you're coming because I have acknowledged that you can be here. Um, and so if this is my building as a principal um, or a superintendent, and I think you know, in school districts where there are multiple buildings, it's usually the principal that encounters the biggest problem um, is that, you know, suddenly they've got a school committee member at their front door. Um, so I think all those things raise for me some serious questions and concerns. Jenny, one, Jack. one of the uh, things that we do here because we have to sign off on the, uh, on the information before the bills are paid, et cetera. The warrant, yep. Yeah. Uh, all three of us will quote blow in to go in and sign sure. effectively and that's what we do 
or we or we'll have to come in and talk to Debbie or, or about the agenda um, or about whatever okay. and but it's direct in direct out otherwise we should go through the uh, the, 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 the principal office. and the superintendent of schools I no, I, I think school committee members and board members always come in to sign off on warrants they have to they're required by law to look at the backup and they're required to sign so absolutely I would expect or that if you have a question about what's coming up on the agenda or what you know particular meeting um, and you wish to come in and speak with Deb I mean obviously she works for you she does work in this capacity for the Board of Trustees as in this in this role so that's perfectly appropriate I see that differently than dropping in to the library or the computer center or a classroom um, when the public is not when the public is not there there are occasions when you have an you know open campus because you want people to come in and see that's a different story so. and obviously you have the right um, so for example if your culinary arts department you know runs the restaurants and it's open to the public there's nothing to bar any member of the trustees from um, utilizing that just like any other Um, this is an issue we've talked about in the past um, and again I think it speaks to the issue of back to the open meeting law and the issue of um, you know what what constitutes uh, you know a, a, a public body or a public meeting which is a quorum of a, of a, of a deliberative body um, and so we've run into this issue when I first joined the board about subcommittees and having a subcommittee that's uh, comprised of a quorum of a board and so we for a while we went away from that uh, we recently had some discussion about it I just wanted to have some clarification on that that if this five member body wished to have subcommittees they could they would need to be um, they are run in conjunction with well they can't be a quorum of the you can't call it you can't no. you can't call a public body by a different name because you say it's a subcommittee if there's a quorum of the body well, that's true, but you don't even need a quorum of the body to be on the subcommittee to have it technically possibly be a subcommittee. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So I, I don't want to lead people astray. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear that a subcommittee of three of the five um, would be a clear convening because you've got, you've got the quorum. But, um, and I skirted the issue of those difficult, nudgy issues about public bodies. Um, but we have had cases where, in fact, there's only been one member of the actual appointed school committee on a particular subcommittee because it's been a more general subcommittee um, and so the issue has been is that a public body within the meaning of the open meeting law and a lot depends upon what their authority is going to be so for example if they are going to review things and make a recommendation um, that back to the full board that um, just give an example these three bidders be thrown out and these two come forward to the board well they've made a very effective choice in that circumstance and I would venture to say that the Attorney General is going to find that that is a public body even though it's only got one board member on it um, which is actually subject to the open meeting law mm -hmm. so my advice has generally been error on the side of considering it to be a public body whenever the board of trustees as opposed to the superintendent of the schools that's mm -hmm. a different ball game when the board of trustees has asked the subcommittee to do something um, and it is something that they're not just um, that that it effectively will inform the decision of the board even though they technically don't have the right to make the decision but just informing the board and carving out information may be enough to still make it a public body so I say her on the side of that the piece I get uh, what I'm just talking about is the structural question of how if, if you would have like, so if, suppose we said okay four out of the five of us are going to be on a special body to oh, no to del that to to discuss something and make yep. a recommendation well that's a sham because four is you know more than enough to is and above a quorum and more exactly more, and more yeah. than enough there's no question about that 
Um, and actually, and I'm not going to get into that because you and the superintendent of Northampton are ex officio. The question is whether the call room is actually potentially smaller. But I'm not going to get into that. It's a nice, neat little technical yeah, question. Yeah, but ex officio means by virtue of your title. Right. It doesn't but, mean that you are not well, a full there's voting actually, there's member. Some interesting case okay. law. It might actually make what makes a quorum even smaller. Okay. That that's all I'm saying. Okay. That's all I'm saying. So uh, basically, I mean, my advice has has been to most committees is where you have a subcommittee. So, for example, when we engage in collective bargaining, we don't generally post those meetings here because it's actually not an official subcommittee. We just have a representative of the board who. I'm actually, you know, generally um, in collaboration with people doing most of the spokesperson. But that issue in some communities, they actually have a collective bargaining subcommittee, in which case collective bargaining sessions are, in fact, subject to the open meeting law. In cases where you don't have in a subcommittee, that's not the question. That's usually not a problem. Okay. But it gets, it gets tricky. Okay. Okay. But my advice on anything that the board does in terms of setting up a smaller group is follow the open meeting law. Better be on the safe side than not. Okay. So it would be a, so it would be okay to have one member acting as a subcommittee of, of one or two members to act as a subcommittee of one. But when you get into a three members, then that's turning into a quorum of the. Of you've the got board. you've got the public body there. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That would be my advice. Okay. Do you feel that the school committee discharges its duty to set goals by approving the district improvement plan and reviewing and approving the school <coughs> improvement plans? Or is there further goal setting that the, the committee needs to do? I think that's probably enough, what you've described. I mean, obviously, I'm not getting into things like strategic plans, and which may add a twist to that. Um, but s since, ironically, um, the statute setting up the authority of the school committee doesn't even talk about goals, it just talks about policy. Um, goals is is more in conjunction with the superintendent and long-range vision for the school. I see that as sufficient. As long as the superintendent is clearly aware of what the expectation is in terms of his particular goals and the goals of the board with regard to Smith itself in the broader sense. How about the distinction between policy and, cur and curriculum? And what do you see in that area? Oh, she's taking a deep breath. I'm taking a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm taking a deep breath because I'm actually, for somebody who represents school committees, I often get the um, Steve Finneran, who's the legal counsel for the Mass Association of School Committees, asking me on occasion, are you sure you're not, you know, secretly from MASS for the superintendent? <laughs> um, if for me, um, there is there are few, let me put it that way, there are few curriculum decisions um, that would fall within policy and not be educational decision making. And when I think of policy in terms of curriculum or I think in a context of, for example, a vocational school, it would be a recommendation that a new shop open up, uh, you know, a total new, what that would involve the expenditure of money and uh, would involve uh, the uh, heightened expenditures that are such that you really, really need, uh, a, that to me is policy. Um, you know, the, the quintessential, um, example that the department has always given over the years in the context of a K through eight, K through twelve system is, you know, you've decided to do a French immersion program. One of your buildings, one of your elementary schools is going to be dedicated 
to everybody just speaking French. Only my town, where Milton could do that, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but in any case, that to me, that's a huge policy decision, but what methodology you use or whether you're going to change the focus of um, a particular program or you're going to expand this particular shop to include new technology that is now emerging as more technologies emerge. That to me is all curriculum and not policy. But a superintendent would still have to bring forward a budget that Absolutely. represents that. And in the capacity yeah. of your budget, yeah. you certainly have the right to vote up or down um, you know, a certain areas of the budget, don't get me started on that because I get very, you know, for, for me, you know, because I envision that really what a board or a school committee is going to be doing is not getting down to the nitty gritty of this much money to wipe out this group of teachers, let's get rid of that. It's more, this is how much we can afford. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Budget actually controls. But if a new shop, if, if the superintendent as the educational leader wanted to propose opening a new shop, shop. he'd and have to bring, he or she would have to bring forward the equipment costs and absolutely. the staffing costs and absolutely. all those things. So that, you know. And that's all the boards. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. But, but, on a, but through their budgetary authority. Right. Which is the same with me as the mayor of the city. I can Correct. I can do certain things administratively, but when it starts to cost money and require more staff, then I need to I need right. to have the the funding to to back that up. And so. you need the body that's going to approve the funding. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, as the person who instigated this, I just want to thank you for. Uh, I've I've uh, I've heard this. I've heard of a variation on this. You actually we came to the Northampton School Committee several years ago, and it was it's very it was very helpful, um, particularly for newer members of a school committee to understand that. Right, so, and, and the public. Were, and actually, that really pre. That was prior to all the real developments. Mm -hmm. the open meeting. And we actually had a member, she just stepped down, but we had a member of the school committee who'd been on there since before Ed reform. Uh, oh. So we had a person. Lisa. Lisa, you, you know Lisa, yeah. I so, do know Lisa, I got so, a thank you note from her. So, yeah, yeah, so she actually is like you, lived through that yes. change, that drastic change in the authority. Right. Yeah, right. okay. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for the materials. Oh, you're welcome. They do come in handy, particularly the open meeting. Um, her advisory is actually fairly clear. If nothing else, Attorney General Keeley does a good job. Thank you, Jenny. My pleasure. So the next.